Hi, everybody. We're going to get started here. Thank you for attending today. My name is Skip Sanzeri. I'm the co-founder and chief operating officer at QSecure. Welcome to our webinar, Quantum Vulnerability for Federal Agencies. At QSecure, our charge is to bring post-quantum cybersecurity to government and enterprise and critical infrastructure entities, all for national security. Uh, also, we're partnering today with Accenture Federal Services on this webinar, hopefully to bring you some hard-hitting information. As many of you know, quantum computers will enable amazing power for humanity. Um, at the same time, this could be uh, in, used, and we expect it's going to be used as a platform for bad actors to disrupt, steal, or cause harm. In this sense, quantum computers can be an existential threat to our U.S. way of life. Um, it's vital at this point that we help federal agencies and commercial enterprises figure out how to build in quote, quantum safe uh, cryptography and quantum resilience to make sure that um, in the event that the worst happens, we're prepared and ready to go. Um, as many of you know, on December 21 of 2022, our federal government took a huge step forward and passed HR 7535, which was the Quantum Cybersecurity Preparedness Act. This act was really quite a milestone for the US as now it's mandating that all federal agencies begin looking at quantum vulnerabilities and starting to assess how to move to the post-quantum world to protect. Um, we applaud this move, as you'll find out today, we expect that reaching critical mass with a quantum computer or a crypt cryptographically relevant computer uh, may come sooner than we all think. And we'll go over some very clever ways that this is getting done around the world. Note that uh, we have Q&A here, and at the bottom of your screens, you guys can enter questions. Um, we're gonna answer all of them at the end, so feel free to enter those, and then we'll hold and we'll read those one by one. Hopefully we'll get to all of them. But if for some reason uh, you aren't able to get your questions answered and you still have those, you can also send an email. Uh, my address is skip, S-K-I-P, at qsecure.com, and we'll make sure that your questions get answered. We're also gonna make this presentation available for everybody after the webinar so you can share it uh, with, with your colleagues. And we'll notify all of you about that um, in, uh, in a day or two once we, uh, we finish the production. So now let's get started, meet some of our presenters for today. We've got an all-star lineup here for you. First up, you're gonna hear from our head of uh, federal operations here at QSecure, Pete Ford. Prior to QSecure, Pete was instrumental in Raytheon's Missile and Defense Organization and was a visiting scientist at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories working on quantum programs. Uh, Pete had an amazing career in the Air Force as an F-15 single seat fighter pilot and weapons school graduate. Today, Pete's gonna talk about quantum computing, the quantum threat and why we need to be concerned now. Again, you're gonna learn about key innovations that are speeding up this process. Um, a lot of us think we need to get to 4,100 qubits um, uh, that are fully coherent and error corrected. Uh, on one machine. You can find, you can learn about ways that, that this might go faster. Following Pete is Aaron Moore, and Aaron's going to discuss some of the ways you can prepare for the quantum era coming. Aaron has had an illustrious career in federal and DOD space as he was the CTO of cyber intelligence at Northrop Grumman. He had C-level and director positions at DARPA, NRO, IARPA, NSA, and Raytheon. Prior to that, Aaron was Army Special Forces in the Airborne Division. And if any of you have seen the movie Black Hawk Down, Aaron commanded the sniper squadrons there. Aaron is resp also responsible for a large number of space assets in his career and was managing one of the largest satellite listening stations in the world at Menwith Hills in the UK. Following Aaron, you're going to hear from Garland Garris. Garland is the leader for quantum security with Accenture, Accenture Federal Services. Prior to AFS, Garland was the former senior leader responsible for cybersecurity for the FBI and is one of the founders of the FBI's Insider Threat Center. Garland is an expert in insider threat programs, data analytics, cyber defense, and operational programs. Garland brings 29 years of professional experience, 15 of which were served with national security agencies. We're so happy to have Garland on with us, helping us through this, this webinar. Batting cleanup is Chris Shear, and Chris is rounding out our amazing group of experts. Chris founded Reardon Logic eight years ago, and Reardon is one of the leading cybersecurity research agencies for DOD customers. At Reardon, 
Chris is the global network architect for the largest private IP network. Prior, Chris was a chief scientist for Northrop Grumman's advanced cyber research group and is the only presenter today who can admit ethically and successfully hacking both a Vegas casino and a Swiss bank. So everybody silence your phones and I would turn them off and put them in another room with Chris around. Anyway, that's our intro for today. I'm gonna to hand over to Pete Ford, who's gonna take it away now. Go ahead, Pete. Thanks, Kim. Good to, good to see uh, quite a few names I recognize here. Uh, I'm with uh, Skip and uh, Franklin Templeton Incubator here in San Mateo, away from Arizona, where I'm uh, close to Aaron and the rest of our crowd. I don't want to in intend to give anybody a, uh, a PhD or your graduate credits on quantum computing, but I do want to break down three uh, things that we're talking about when you hear the word quantum. One, uh, computing side is different. Classical bits are one or zero. Qubits, quantum, once we get them entangled, they can be a zero, one, one zero or any of those all at the same time. So the math becomes significantly different, uh, i.e. some non-polynomial math that we have to take guesses at or Monte Carlo's at on the classical side in a quantum computer. Once we get them uh, error corrected and handled with qubits, we can get to the real number, some impossible things done fast. So that's quantum computing. We're talking about that. But quantum, as we think on the federal side or what our, our team like to focus is it really has three aspects. There's the quantum computing side. We'll talk about how much is being spent to make a uh, error corrected, free, fault tolerant quantum computer. There's quantum communication side, our side of post quantum com along with quantum key distribution, things that deal with uh, passing information via uh, quantum. That is quantum communication. And then there's quantum sensing. When we talk about how much the federal government or is being spent globally, most people don't break it down into ah, that much was actually being spent on quantum sensing where I'm doing a quantum Fourier transform or I'm tying qubits together to get a response out of one tied to another or that amount of money was actually spent on quantum keys tied and seeing how long I can keep them up or on post quantum communication that works like we do with a quantum secure layer. There's there's a little breakdown between those, but I want everybody to know and they all get lumped together when you hear the word quantum for us we're. My part of what I want to let you know today is the adversary has a vote. We don't know what that vote is, but we know the quantum computer that they're after is a crypto anically or a cryptanically relevant quantum computer that can take our asymmetric keys. Next slide, please, Pat. So with that threat in mind and the complete understanding, you now know and see a collect now, a store now, a harvest now, all to decrypt later is because I can do that math with a fault tolerant quantum computer or a crypto anically quantum computer. I want as much data as I can because then I get after those asymmetric keys that are vulnerable to a quantum computer. Uh, I, not only am I gonna get some great quantum breakthroughs, some great quantum sensing, some things we've never done before for the good of mankind, I'm actually coming after some things that you keep and what you think you keep secret is no longer secret to me. That's the part that we're focused on and we don't want that to be an unknown. There's a lot of unknowns in there, but that's why we don't want our data that we hold pretty precious in the wrong hands. Next slide. There's been a lot of words, a lot of uh, executive orders, uh, a lot of behind the scenes uh, workups and study and good old fashioned tradecraft on the technical growth of how much and how fast is this coming to us? What does it mean to for my data at rest? What does it mean for data in transition? And then what does it mean because data in the federal and the public sector still has to move and we can't go back to fax machine. So pay attention to all the different pieces from, in our particular case, a, a federal perspective that the, all the words that a normal federal group would hear like the JADC2 or Transec or Mosaic Warfare, Warfighter Communications, the standards that we have for uh, Indo and Exo Atmospheric, those are all pieces that we're used to hearing. You also need to think about that in the internal control system or uh, SCADA side of the house that our infrastructure is built on, water, heat, et cetera. Pay attention to all of those. And then we'll bring up and be happy to get you. And you can listen to other webinars or hear what we had from a National Security Memorandum 8 and 10. The uh, executive orders that, that is what we're talking about, 14028. Then Office of Management and Budget right before Thanksgiving came out and said that we're serious. The time is serious and the money's going to flow. Get rid of those old 
you know, systems that are very vulnerable to this and get new, we're going to have to do this or the adversary is going to have a leg up on us. And then the next piece is pay attention to what the adversary is doing. If you go to the next slide, we'll go a little bit of that and then I'll turn it over to Aaron. When, when you study different pieces and parts, there's papers coming out all the time. I have another paper coming out in two weeks on the hybrid classical quantum noisy intermediate scale quantum computing and what that means to us for variational quantum factoring or for how we use a classical computer with its benefits with a noisy intermediate scale computer and its benefits to get after some of these uh, solutions as well as understand the threat. In this case, the top two, and if, if anybody here happens, we, we've got uh, words and books and webinars on it, but it was right after Christmas, the third paper that we found out of China uh, coming was a deep, uh, uh, basically an IEEE peer-reviewed type paper. It wasn't actually IEEE, but it was peer-reviewed. And it speaks to not that top number that you see, the 4,099 fault-tolerant quantum computers, it uh, quantum bits. It speaks to how do I work a classical computer with a quantum computer together that doesn't need 4,100 qubits. I can get after some of these RSA pieces before I have a, a, a shore-based computer. There's a lot of math going in there. There's a lot of technical pieces going to it, but it all points to a, a mixture between a hybrid of a classical and a quantum computer working together. The four you have listed here, all credit goes to Alex Kahn, who's an advisor for us. Great man to listen and learn from. Those top two are the, a prioritizer of what, what I think uh, he thinks are most important. We can get more information from him. I, I do mention those top two because that is where I think we're going to get the ability to get a cryptanically relevant computer with all the binary optimization, all the uh, corrections between the errors of the qubits that fall in and out of entanglement. We're going to get those going faster when we use a hybrid classic quantum and we put them in a series. I, you would start looking for a country that has thousands of kilometers of photonic lineups with noisy intermediate scale quantum computers along the way because they can use those to string things together. And that's what we see in China. And in that paper that I mentioned that in the third page, China says, we're using this to measure how fast we can break RSA. In other words, your asymmetric keys. So do pay attention that when we think about how much money is being spent, we talked about the hundred billion prior to the 14th five-year plan from 2015 until about 2020, it, when you take the World Health Organization and the World Economic Forum, it was measured that China had spent 15.1 billion, 15.2, sorry, and we had spent 2.1. We don't know what it's on, whether it's quantum computing, quantum com, or quantum sensing, but we know there's a focus there. And we know that focus is one of the votes that they have a chance. Beyond that, there's always uh, wicked smart mathematicians working to make more efficient quantum algorithms. And then the other part is we can come back in and learn from those, do some reverse multiplication of the binary optimization that we looked at before and add back in so we get faster. That gets really deep into what we're seeing as natural technical growth, but then that technical growth that's applied to an asymmetric key for decryption, that becomes a threat to us, not just on the federal, but on the commercial and the federal. So with, with all that being said, we're after it. That's why I'm so excited about QSecure. We're a U.S. founded, funded, and focused company that's designed to work on your existing information technology infrastructure, setting up a quantum secure layer behind the TLS and, and trying not to get any bandwidth or latency hits. We've got a, the string of pros and, and a series of webinars you can look at, all, including this one, going over with Aaron, uh, and then glad to have Garland and Chris here. So Aaron, with that, with everybody being sufficiently scared, my brother, over to you. Okay, so everybody, um, Pete, thanks for the uh, for, for that intro. What you have to uh, think about in our way in which we uh, use the internet today, how we communicate, everything is based on uh, secure relationships and trust being established uh, between servers and clients uh, to be able to share data, to set up sessions. Uh, the, the host of, of, of um, capabilities that are out there. And it would not serve us at all today without that level of security. But as you already gathered, uh, the enemy of all cryptography is time. 
And time is what uh, the quantum computer gives us now in order to break the cryptography that we, that we currently use to be able to uh, communicate on the internet, to exchange data, to buy things. Uh, none of this would be possible without that underlying um, cryptography. And we call that PKI. So it's a public key infrastructure that's out there that uh, everybody uses in order to um, use the internet appropriately. Government agencies, everybody else. Next slide. So the problem though with quantum computing is that by using the mathematical capabilities there, the quantum computer can actually extract private keys from public keys. So why would that matter? If you think about it, all of your hardware, all of your computers, all of your embedded devices, uh, your cable TV box, they are all carrying certificates that are signed by a certificate authority to um, express the validity of that particular device. So Microsoft has certificate stores, Apple, Google, Mozilla, your web browser has them. If you go on and search on certificates, you'll find them. They're embedded in your system. They come with the operating system. Uh, all of those certificates, public keys, are used when you go to a particular site. For instance, you type in google.com. How does your browser know that that's really Google? Dot com and not somebody else. Well, it's by comparing the certificate that the server gives back to your browser and your browser then comparing it to a certificate that it has in its store to validate that that's a particularly trustworthy site. Okay, so you can see on the left, the embedded devices in a standard cable TV box, right? At the top, there's a root certificate. In the middle, there's what call, is called an intermediate certificate. And then there are leaf certificates below that. The reason that this structure is established is because the root certificates, if they are compromised, then all of the devices in that family that rely on those certificates can become compromised. So they use intermediate certificates. These intermediate certificates are signed by the root and they have the ability to issue leaf certificates. It's all important because if the intermediate certificate is compromised, then there's only a part of your infrastructure that you need to worry about and replace. Well, the government has lots of certificates. They have uh, public domain certificates, and then there's private certificates that are uh, issued by governmental agencies. If you go in and, and you check, you'll see uh, a variety of them, and that's to ensure that you're not going to a uh, fraudulent site. So now what happens if somebody does get a hold of it, with, say with a quantum computer, and I own the private key, I can then forge a certificate that isn't just a facsimile, it's an identical copy. And your browser will not be able to distinguish uh, whether or not it's going to a legitimate site. This is not just a problem when you communicate to a site, like you go to Amazon and you wanna order something and buy it and feel safe. But all your embedded systems, all of your uh, automatic updates, the software is calling out to a server for those updates. And if that certificate is forged, then that server can install malicious code directly onto your device. Next slide. So what then would happen is you wouldn't even know that your, uh, your device has uh, malicious code installed on it. So we get back to the time domain that we uh, that Pete was talking about, you know, the steal now, decrypt later. Well, guess what? All those certificates that I was just talking about are sitting there available to anybody with a quantum computer that they can try and extract the public key from and then digitally sign and issue new certificates that are absolute forgeries that are undetectable. Right now, they can do that. 
right? With the, with the appropriately um, powerful quantum computer. You'll never know. You'll never know. It's all a matter of time. There's a hundred billion devices out there that use the PKI chain to be able to do the appropriate updates. But it's not just uh, the certificates on uh, the web servers themselves, but once again, the time factor, and uh, Garland's gonna talk a little bit about this, to be able to extract a private key from a public key in the midst of a session being established strikes right at the heart of uh, transactional security. Next slide. And what you see here is just an example. Uh, and I just picked one uh, for crypto since people uh, seem to be looking at distributed ledgers and web 3.0 technologies. Uh, this becomes a very, uh, a big problem in the crypto space because all of the, uh, the signatures that are used on transactions use asymmetric keys. This in, or asymmetric algorithms, excuse me. So this one is just showing you for like uh, an Ethereum, they use elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman for signatures uh, to, to sign transactions. The blockchain also uses these signatures to verify uh, who and, and what is in that particular transaction. Smart contracts use them. So you're looking at a variety of different use cases in which during the transaction, the uh, quantum computer has the potential to extract a private key and set up a false transaction, redirect where that crypto is going, for instance, uh, what wallet it's going into, and then uh, you know disappear with all all of uh, all of the value of that uh, that particular digital currency. One of the big challenges that we have, as I mentioned with the um, intermediate certificates, the lifespan on those certificates, if you go in your certificate store right now, uh, you can look them, like I said, it's, it's on, uh, just look for certificates, you'll find them. And uh, it's on the Keychain app in uh, Apple. And what you'll see is that those intermediate certificates are sometimes valid for 25 years. 25 years, I mean, all the way out to 30, 20, 38 and, and longer for, for a number of these things. So imagine if somebody was able to replicate one of those and present it to your browser, guess what, you'll never know. Next slide. The other part of it is in the future is we're looking at blockchain technologies, other distributed ledgers. Uh, what you have are issues with data provenance because now you can never really trust whether the data, even though it's signed, isn't signed by somebody that has uh, a fraudulent certificate because they've extracted the private key from an, an original authority. So now you can trigger smart contracts, you can uh, corrupt the blockchain, um, just a, a host of other uh, nefarious things that can happen. Next slide. And this is an example of some of the impact. There was a study done on what would happen if the, the uh, power grid was hit with this, because as I mentioned, all these embedded devices use certificates to get updates for firmware for other software components. And uh, an attack like this on the grid could result in a, a $12.8 trillion uh, problem. That's a pretty big problem. And we want to avoid that. Next slide. But there are number, so there are a number of things that we need to be able to uh, accomplish in order to prevent some of these things. And we've already uh, talked about um, these cryptographic algorithms being replaced by post quantum resilient algorithms. But throughout your entire enterprise, it's going to need to be automated. It needs to be dynamic, have crypto agility, not just for the strength uh, of the particular key that's being used to secure something, but because the hardware that may exist inside your enterprise uh, can't deal with the overhead necessary uh, for uh, encryption and decryption operations, or the bandwidth that uh, is consumed because of these longer key links. So there's, there are a lot of things to consider. Uh, 
what we've developed is a, a security and management plane that helps enforce these policies, key rotations, things like that, uh, so that uh, a lot of the issues that the PKI system today has are resolved and allow you to move into a post-clone world. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Garland and he can bring you up to date more on uh, a lot of where this technology is moving. And Garland, just before you come on here, if you, if you mind, I might interrupt. Um, so for the audience, uh, we have Q&A down below. We've got a couple of questions in, but I want to let you know, please ask your questions using that uh, mechanism at the bottom. And we're going to answer everything at the end. Thank you. Uh, please, Garland, proceed. Thanks, Kip. Uh, so um, I want to talk a little bit about why post-quantum cryptography is something that government agencies specifically need to focus on now. Um, and it's not a future issue uh, due to a, a couple of base reasons. But uh, with that, next slide. Um, I was fortunate to be able to work in law enforcement and uh, the intel community for several years and got to see firsthand how adversaries are stealing data uh, encrypted or not, but stealing it with the intent of um, cracking later. And that's referred to as uh, SNDL or hack now, crack later. Uh, but certainly it's, it's a tactic that adversarial nations uh, states take. Um, uh, me and, and I'm sure several of you on the line likely had your data stolen with the uh, OMB hack several years ago, uh, hopefully, it's encrypted somewhere, but uh, even the most uh, pessimistic estimates of when a quantum computer will be created to uh, uh, crack that, uh, uh, it's, it's still gonna be relevant to, to all of us <laughs> within our lives when that is, uh, when that is uh, cracked. So there are solutions out uh, now where uh, data can be secured so that even if it is stolen, then it doesn't uh, matter because it cannot be cracked by a quantum computer because it doesn't depend on prime number factor uh, factorization. Uh, it's a it's a different type of um, uh, mathematics that secures them. So there are solutions now to protect data. So for government agencies, especially those who work in the intel space, it's not uncommon to um, classify information for 50 years. And certainly, again, the most pessimistic estimates of when a quantum computer will be created much, much, much sooner than that. Um, so given there are solutions uh, now, that's the first reason. The second is just the footprint that has to be secured. And for those of you who have worked in the federal government, large agencies, um, they make small course corrections or sort of like the Titanic. Um, that, personal experience, IPv4 to IPv6 took almost a decade in an agency that I worked in. Um, so it's going to take a bit of time. There's, especially in the Department of Defense, you're talking millions of endpoints and um, combat systems that are unique. So it's, it's a bit of a road to walk down. Next slide, please. So that being said, and you've heard a little bit about the threat, I want to level set just a little bit. Um, most quantum computers that are out there today are 50 to 100 qubits. That's changing quickly. IBM came out with a 400 qubit computer this year. They have plans for a thousand qubit computer uh, this year before the year ends. Um, not error corrected, but still you can see the investment that's pouring into the space is yielding benefit. And estimates for uh, when quantum computers will be able to crack modern cryptography are consistently moving to the left. Um, from a practical use, it's going to be a while before we can leverage quantum computers um, in, in a uh, everyday scenario, and you're never going to use them for uh, for a lot of tasks. Quantum computers are great at, at solving problems that have exactly one answer, and thus for prime number factorization, you know, you take two very large prime numbers, multiply them together, and you get the product. Everyone can do that with uh, with paper or and certainly with a computer. Going the other way, of course, much more difficult. Um, but given uh, the uh, Shor's algorithm, which we'll talk about briefly, and then given uh, the, the way in which quantum computers work, they are very good at conducting that type of calculation. 
So with progress, there has been increased funding. Um, we, we talked about a little bit of that in 2021 dollars, I think China alone put 10 billion in uh, quantum information science. Some of that was in post quantum cryptography, uh, some compute and the federal government for the first time spent over a billion dollars, which is great to see, but you can see those two numbers aren't aligned very well. Uh, and there's a lot of work to do. Next slide, please. So this is, um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Shores, but this is something I really like to talk about as far as the type of advancements you can have in the quantum computing space. There was an RSA conference several years ago where an example was given um, that if you were somehow able to take every computer on the planet and put them to common purpose, it would still take about 14 billion years just to crack one key. And then, you know, if you work at RSA, you can back up and say, no, that's security. And at that time, it would have been right until P Peter Shor's uh, algorithm in 1994. And then that reduced the time from 14 billion years to 20 or 10 or five or however long it takes to create a quantum computer of sufficient qubit size to tackle a uh, specific key length size. So in this slide that you see, and as an example, it'll take about 2050 qubits to crack RSA 1024 about three and a half hours to do that. And like I mentioned, uh, with the money coming in, IBM's release of a 400 uh, qubit computer, not error corrected, but you know, getting there. As this investment comes in, consistent uh, advances are being made. And uh, that's just a staggering, you know, advancement, you know, billions of years to just a few. And as you can see, the middle line there for sure is uh, a typical approach in the past had been to increase the key length size to make it more difficult to crack. But with Shor's algorithm, that really yields no benefit um, as the algorithm becomes more efficient, the longer the key length is. Next slide, please. So since um, May 2021, when 14028 was released, uh, there hasn't been a time in history that so much has changed on the cyber policy side. Um, since 14028, you had uh, 2209 that focused on zero trust requirements, um, you know, a litany of others, 2131 for logging requirements, and, and federal agencies have been uh, doing what they can to comply with those policy requirements. A couple that, uh, that came out that specifically relate to quantum computing and uh, NSM-8, another uh, important one to mention. NSM-8 actually applied 14028 to all IC agencies and law enforcement. Uh, prior to that, it was only federal civilian executive branch agencies that had to comply. This memo changed that. Uh, it also leveled a, a levied a requirement for inventory of um, systems and uh, algorithms that were vulnerable to quantum computers by last May. That was for national security systems. NSM-10 then followed and levied a similar requirement on FCEBs um, to do their, uh, to, to conduct an inventory of uh, systems that are vulnerable to quantum computers by July, 2023, which is coming up. And of course, as was mentioned, uh, December 21, the president uh, signed HR uh, 7535 into law, which requires an annual uh, inventory of crypto, which is vulnerable to quantum computers. That, uh, at a base level, that means all asymmetric cryptography. So any place there's PKI certainly is vulnerable to quantum computers. It also would include all symmetric cryptography that is not AES-256. Uh, so certainly a lot has changed, but that, um, you know, on the policy front, but that law sets requirements for agencies that they must comply with now. So there's, there's a lot of uh, movement on the federal side, a lot of briefings going on. And these dates are sort of the more important ones to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, certainly NIST competition, where they were evaluating algorithms, which would be quantum safe, uh, finalized with four algorithms selected. Uh, there were two general ones, Crystal's Kyber and Dilithium, uh, which were selected. And the NSA added them to their CNSA suite 2.0 a few months ago. 
So those have now been um, at least signed off by the NSA. We are still waiting for the NIST standard, which is going to be released in 2024. But as you can see, there's a huge focus by the federal government now in this space. Next slide, please. And as mentioned, so CNSA Suite 2.0, they added di dilithium and kyber. Um, you know, dilithium is this a uh, the signatures algorithm and Kyber is the, the Kim. Um, and the timeline that's shown there at the bottom, starting now through 2023 for full adoption, um, that's not a lot of time. So if you're a DOD component and you're thinking of how much has to be replaced by 2033, it's, it's a pretty large effort. And, and also consider that you can't take the forklift approach. You have to provide a transition method that is not disruptive. And that's really where the work is. Um, and you know, there's, there's quite a bit uh, uh, being done now, planning-wise. Um, as far as Accenture Federal is concerned, the agencies that we are uh, helping and um, have briefed up, we provide a phased approach at approaching this, which starts with inventory, followed by planning and uh, going to actual adoption. It is it is somewhat customized depending on the customer and de depending on the ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, uh, I will hand over to Chris and happy to take questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Garland. So this portion of the uh, webinar, we're going to talk about what you can do today. Uh, Rin Logic and our team had the privilege of uh, partnering with QSecure to do the first quantum resilient deployment within the United States Air Force. So we're going to talk about that process, lessons learned, and things that we can leverage for other groups, both inside and outside the U.S. government. Next slide, please. So core technology that allowed us to enable this is a uh, quantum entropy key source that's FIP certified, so a good random number generator. Beyond that, nothing is exotic. We base this off of COTS architecture, stuff that you can get through your normal supply chain, which reduces our delays. Um, different attributes that have been useful is a zero touch key distribution. So anyone who's worked with uh, type one encryptors have bought this challenge. Um, Technology is built on something that is crypto agile. So we're currently basing it off crypto, uh, Crystal's Kyber. However, as uh, other forerunners come forward or alternatives that have more export options, um, we can deploy in that. In there, we build quantum resilient tunnels. We refer to them as QSL in, the, in this technology. However, it rides over IP and TLS. So if you can transmit IP, then we can overlay, uh, overlay a quantum resilient solution and additional security is attack, detention, uh, attack detection, centralized auth and deauth, as well as um, adaptive keying for different scenarios. If you need lots of keys, lots of rotations for higher risk, you can do it. If you want to save bandwidth, you go the other way. And this is uh, the technology we would deploy in the US Air Force. Next up, please. So taking this base technology and applying it to two areas, today there's two main areas that you can deploy. One is a upgrade path on the left, you everywhere where you can take your servers, embed this technology, and then have a non-modified web browser be quantum resilient. The other is Q network. That is, uh, think of that like a VPN or a pair of bulk encryptors where you take all your data, it combines in, gets wrapped in a quantum resilient, goes over a traditional transfer transport medium, gets unwrapped, and then it appears uh, the same on the backside. The benefit of the solution on the left is you don't have to touch all your clients. The benefit on the solution on the right is you don't have to touch your sender or your listener. So you can have legacy solutions out there that we overlay this uh, protection on. The uh, solution on the right is what we deployed for the, uh, for the Air Force. Next up. All right, so how do you do this as an organization? Um, no matter what the technology is, this is a general flow that can be used for uh, addressing the quantum threat in your organization. So scanning can be done of where are vulnerable systems. Garland talked about some uh, future solutions and uh, present offerings on what can be done to determine what your inventory of problems are out there. That can be a passive scan where we monitor traffic that's flowing, or it can be an active scan where you interrogate the different systems out there. 
that is combined with expert knowledge. So the, your SMEs and your environment, they know where your weaker crypto is in a lot of cases. The other thing they know is they know where your critical data is. You combine that weaker crypto, critical data, and then new greenfield projects, because if we're deploying something right now, specifically if we're architecting it right now, we know this is a problem. We know we need to make this future proof. So bake that in from day one. Um, if this sounds a lot like 853 in RMF, that's because it is. Just because we put the word quantum in front of it doesn't mean our classic risk mitigation strategies that we've been working with decades can't be applied. So we put those in a weighted risk matrix. That's unique per organization, but generally that includes how critical is the data, how exposed is the data, what's the classification level of that data, and what is the cost slash risk tolerance of upgrading it. Put that in a plan of action milestones. So you rack and stack, which ones do we want to do first? And then we go through a path of either upgrading the crypto libraries, the so upgrade in the center and don't touch your clients or upgrade the path that's flowing. That's the, uh, the VPN analogy to make them quantum resilient. By following this process, it allows us to run in parallel. We've identified one of these through the scanning or expert knowledge, and it can start running through the whole path of to full mitigation before we have even the scanning done. Next up, please. All right, so how does this look in the real world? Let's say um, we beat up a little bit on the OMB, but there's been a risk in a lot of different places. So if we've got something like a OMB website, find where we wanna protect it. And a great example would be something that's public, publicly accessible. We upgrade that website, just like you do any other website upgrade, you would only upgrade portion of it, unit test across multiple, multiple users as it works, move more users over into the quantum resilient solution. Then we go through in the loop and do it on the second on your second priority item. Now that's great for the front end, but what about the back end? So in the back end, we've got an example of an embassy trying talking back to the US. We determine what a priority information flow is over there. We deploy a quantum resilient tunnel out of there into, um, into our central consolidation point. And then we route the critical information we want to protect inside that tunnel. Thing to note, existing type one encrypt, uh, crypto, existing transports, existing other crypto, we can layer inside or outside that. So takeaway is it's not rolling, it's rolling upgrades. It's not a forklift change and it's possible today. So the call to action I'm bringing to this group is find the easiest, simplest thing you can to prove it's possible. Try it once, run through the process. You'll figure out how to identify and optimize it for your organization, just like you do any other information technology upgrade. Then start doing some more critical things. There's no reason to wait for tomorrow or make a huge forklift. You can do it all today. Next slide, please. Skip, I'm gonna to toss it over to you for any questions. Absolutely, Chris, thank you. And thank you to all the presenters today. Fantastic group. Hopefully this was quite informational. Let's move to q and I'd ask our presenters, if you could, since we have a variety of questions to get through, please try to keep your answer to one minute. Um, for those asking questions, if that one minute doesn't completely satisfy, again, send an email in, uh, skip at QSecure, happy to go in depth and, and, and uh, further. So uh, first uh, question is for Aaron and Chris, uh, both, and you guys can share this one. Um, have any of the products that claim to be quantum resilient, uh, are they accredited by a government agency validating these claims? If so, uh, what are some of the accreditations and what would, you, what would you suggest to keep an eye on that? So we know that the, uh, the algorithm, Kyber algorithm was uh, uh, approved. So you could say it's accredited by NIST. And uh, that is what we are implementing. Uh, Everybody else is still waiting on some of the additional uh, post-quantum algorithms to be certified, but I would watch NIST for that. You, anything else, Chris? The other additional level of accreditation is we're working through the general system ATO accreditation with a couple of customers. We're in the early phases of that, um, but there's a big pull to get that through. Great, thank you, Aaron. Chris, next question, uh, Pete and Garland are up here bring Pete into the screen, here we go. Do, you, do we have data on what relative number of RSA versus ECDSA versus AES versus SHA-2 use for federal agency, or is that something which needs to be looked at individually with government CIOs? 
uh, that turns out anonymous attendee. That's a great question. Garland, it looks, uh, when I read that, it's basically going to look at all the different types of encryptions we have. And if you read the OMB uh, that came out right after Thanksgiving, it basically says in the table at the bottom, if you get that, just look at the, you can actually uh, investigate it and find it. At the table at the bottom, there's two tables. That second table says, and when you do, ask each government agency to identify them by this order. And you're, you're identifying them, RSA, the elliptic curve piece, AES, SHA-2, because I want them listed because the ones that are most vulnerable are the first ones that we're going to identify. So those are in some cases, but OMB has said, we want them all and we want you to list them and make it count for what you got. Garland, what did I miss on that? Because it, it's OMB webinar perfect. Yeah, no, I think you answered pretty concisely. And those are pretty much the uh, usual suspects. You're going to find those at every federal agency. There are some offshoots and um, specific algorithms that are used, um, especially in the uh, IC space, that are a little bit different. So it just depends on the customer and uh, you know speaks to the need for the assessment and the inventory so that you can just look at the ecosystem, look at what you're having to transition. And that affects the timeline to transition as well. And it's a rat's answer. nest. Mark Garland, would you, th I mean, it's an OMB webinar for goodness sakes. That This is the, the, the heart of the question. Yeah. Dig into the rat's nest. Because we, we got encryption. Heck, you guys, we've got uh, uh, TDES still out there. Uh, and SHA-2, uh, we've got a lot of old encryption. That's what the Office of Management and Budget says. We're, we're not going to fund this old stuff anymore because it puts us in too much of a vulnerable state. Identify across your network those most vulnerable and, and all of them so we can get a modernization plan that brings in post-quantum communication that keeps us at the speed of mosaic utility and warfare. Garland, is that but what you're reading too? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm trying to stick within the minute, so apologies. But I just wanted to follow on with that, is that um, with every federal agency, um, you have a number of networks. You've got enterprise IT, and if you're talking about law enforcement, intel community, unclass, secret, TS, whatever. But then you also have a number of island networks that are all by themselves. This also applies to the industrial control base. You've got enterprise IT, you've got operational technology. These are separate. So every one of these has to be handled as an individual project. You know, so there's a lot of logistics that goes into planning. Uh, this is uh, complying with these requirements and now the law. And that's yet another reason that federal agencies need to start now. Uh, we're, we're working with Garland and Accenture. If you, whoever, if you have our email address, Pete at QSecure.com, write me. We, we've got a, a highlighted, uh, that circular, we've got it highlighted along with the rest of the National Security Mem Memorandums and some deep packet inspection options to let you, if you're part of that federal workplace, let you identify how you can find those and, and then work with us. And we'll, we got other questions, I'm sure, on what we can do to help fix it. Thank you, Pete. And Garland, next question. Um, Chris, I'd like you to start this one out and have Aaron join you as well. Um, what's a good security stack to secure my platform with international customers? So the export laws on this are, are evolving every day, so I'm not going to uh, dig into that too much. But having something that is based off of a NIST NSA standard algorithm for deriving your asymmetric key and then doing high key rotation rates, using that as a transport is uh, the way to push it out there. Emma, anything to add? No, no, I think that's it. Uh, just good uh, cybersecurity hygiene. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, uh, Pete and Chris. Um, in light of Shadow's paper and Yan's paper out of China, do you have a recommended risk schema or framework to help organizations prioritize where post-quantum encryption should be applied first, especially the government inf information, especially outside of classified data, which is already prioritized through our marketing slash delineation? Thanks very much. Clam, good to see you, man. I hope uh, studies are going well. Yes, uh, we, we do have some recommended risk. It's the first place you can put it that's A, going to adopt it, B, not going to interrupt uh, current uh, frameworks, and three, be able to grow in place for TRL maturation, i.e. Uh, test with it at TRL four or five, 
and then go to six and then expand it across. When you remember Chris uh, talking about the Q network and then the Q everywhere side, our Q network piece is ideal for operation centers, but then it can also be stemmed out to Q everywhere and you get it across your website. And then we can also stem it up to SATCOM. So I would recommend in that order, Chris, what am I missing or what's a low hanging fruit that I didn't kick over? Adding on what Shadow said, you've got your CMMC 800-171 on the unclassified side that already tells you what your largest risk areas are. If you don't have secure comms or there's a risk of, of um, eavesdropping on that, those are the first ones you look at. In the purely commercial side, just uh, ask yourself, what are we scared that someone might get or see? Start there. And then, Clam, I do owe you a, a deeper dive on the Yan second order. I got that coming to you, and I've got some other players to bring in, in touch with you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, Aaron, this one's for you. Uh, do you have more on the threats you talked about in terms of certificates that can be shared? Um, have you seen these in the wild today, for example? Yeah, for instance, there was a there were a number of uh, compromised certificate authorities a few years ago. Uh, you can read them about about them on um, online. It, uh, Komodo was one of the big ones. You'll see that you have Komodo certificates, by the way, in your certificate store on your uh, in your operating systems. So they cleaned up their mess. Another one was uh, DigiNoter, which was out of the Netherlands. They were compromised. Um, so there's a number of uh, people that have looked and they estimate over 200,000 malware um, components have valid digital certificates associated with them. And in fact, uh, the most famous one, um, Stuxnet, had uh, authentic digital certificates from Realtek Semiconductor and J Micron. Uh, on on it. So once again, if you can spoof that certificate, uh, you own whatever device you're on. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron. Next question. Greg asked, will we share this presentation at the end? Absolutely. We've been recording it and we'll make it available to everybody. Um, you'll be able to uh, view it ongoing uh, from our site. Uh, and we should have it up and produced in a day or two. So yes, we'll, we'll get this out to everybody. Um, next question. Uh, this one is going to be for Pete. Can you talk about partnering opportunities with QSecure and Accenture Federal, oh, actually in Garland as well, and Accenture Federal Services? Are there any SBA or 8A uh, set-aside opportunities? Uh, that's a, a great question. And yes, we won a uh, Super Phase 3 in May of last year, which allows us to be a sub or a prime. Also good if we're working with an 8A or another uh, small business administration player developing rdt and &E or uh, uh, in innovative research capability of the government, we can protect that data under our data rights assertion. And by the way, we're, we're allowed to work with any one of 12 different agencies that Accenture obviously works with too and more. So yeah, teaming as far as a sub or a prime with us is great. And working with uh, pros like Garland at Accenture makes it even better. In other words, there's no reason one of our federal players not just DOD, but commerce or labor or state or NASA or DOE, any one law enforcement, et cetera, shouldn't be able to get something in their hands to get after this protection right now, working with us or working with us and Accenture, especially with the phase three and their, their level of detail. Garland, what did I miss? That is good. Um, just a, uh, just a, uh, I guess, advertisement for Accenture. <laughs> so we are working across the federal government and pretty much um, every every sector, um, you know, energy and industrial control and law enforcement and national security. And uh, there are specific contract opportunities that come out that require 8A involvement. Um, so I'm open to engaging with uh, those who want to reach out to me. You can hit me up on LinkedIn or, you know, garland.garris at accenturefederal.com. And, um, you know, certainly happy to discuss opportunities. Thank you, thank you. Uh, for Aaron and Chris, with the ETH example, how does that change if the key values are increased? So you've got uh, the same same challenge with any uh, key length that uh, if the quantum computer is big enough, it really doesn't care. The key length is, is pretty irrelevant. 
Uh, the challenge with ETH is that they issue a certificate that is long lived uh, for you to be able to uh, deal with the keys in your wallet. Whereas for instance, uh, Bitcoin, uh, they rotate their certificates for their signing much more often. So they're less secure or less uh, vulnerable to that type of a um, uh, compromise. So as long as those long-lived certificates are out there, you saw how uh, the R RSA could be cracked in uh, three and a half hours or so. So if I've got a certificate that's valid for five years, I have five years to crack it. And certainly a quantum computer can do that. Yeah, so building on that, doing the uh, high rotation rate on the certificates as a future EIP in, Ether in Ethereum will be something that'd be useful. All right, thank you, Chris, Aaron. Uh, Garland, Pete. Uh, Garland, why don't you lead this one and then Pete uh, back up. Cyber it was talked about for years and then it became an immediate need due to threats. Where are we on the curve on quantum threats and what is the timeline range of course for implementation? Um, again, just want to re-mention something that I uh, briefly mentioned before and in, in that um, because of tactics for stealing data and cracking it, then I'd say our timeline for implementation or starting is now. As far as um, if, if the question is uh, when I actually believe uh, that modern day crypto is gonna be hacked or crackable, then that's unknowable. You know, And uh, the, this paper that came out recently from China, certainly interesting. I think it definitely will be a multifaceted approach that actually first poses a real threat. But when that happens, it's not gonna be posted on LinkedIn. You know, So <laughs> the nation state actors are gonna do what they do best and you know, get in your environment and steal data as long as they can until the federal government gets in front of it or the private sector. But um, it's something that has to be addressed really now. And again, with solutions available that can secure data now, it's, it's really something that, uh, you know, why wait? I know every CIO, has sort of a tech investment equity review for where you spend your dollars. But this is something that's real. And, um, you know, technology is pervasive throughout all of our lives, not just our business. And crypto is every place we have technology. So it's difficult to overstate the impact and especially in the context of industrial control, you know, impact. So uh, I hope that answers it, sort of goes around it a bit, but. Uh, yeah, I, 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 it, man, you, you hit some great points, Garland. I will tell you, you, you always run the risk in the world we live in, any world we live in, when the, we know that the adversary has a vote and we're trying to make sure we meet that so we shore up what our nation needs. You don't want to make an adversary 10 foot tall or act like they've already uh, accomplished something. I, I, I do think we point out three or four things that are important. One, they've been looking at this and they've admitted they're looking at this in a very focused way, in a very fiscally focused way, in a very personnel focused way for a lot longer than we have. That doesn't mean necessarily they've gotten as much done. It just points to there is there is a lot of smoke over there. They're, they're likely to be fired. If that fire is indeed a quantum computer that is focused on breaking asymmetric keys, we need to be very aware of it. So that's what we're looking at. The other thing is I would encourage everybody here, please get in touch with us. If you read the executive orders, uh, the national security memos, read the OMB, read, read the other things that come out of uh, open source documents, listen and read the words of a cryptanically relevant quantum computer versus just declaring a fault tolerant quantum computer. And what that entails is there is going to be an opportunity that we don't know. That Shor's algorithm is one thing. We don't know what's cryptanically relevant yet because there's a number of ways to get after something that is crypto analytically relevant because it can break your key. That's where we are on the curve. When does a CRQC come out and what have we already done about it? Because by then it's too late. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, for the audience, uh, we are at time. Uh, we're going to continue to answer questions if you'd like to stay on. Uh, our, our team will stay here. Uh, prior to that, though, I want to let you know we have another webinar coming up February 22nd. Now, this is on securing financial transactions. We've got some experts here. Steve Cleave ran a big piece of financial transactions over at Google. Uh, Lisa Hammett um, as, as an expert in AI and had done a ton of work at Visa. 
uh, and leading their AI group in transactions. So uh, feel free to uh, to register for that. We'll keep going on Q and A now. Um, Chris and Aaron, um, uh, question: I don't think that NIST has approved any PQC algorithm yet that was accepted in round four. They're working on uh, FIPS docs for each of the software. That's so it's brought up to speed. The NSA didn't. NSA rep didn't feel any of the four accepted algorithms are approved for use yet. Well, the point was that after round three, NIST selected those four algorithms to go through the standardization process. So they they are the algorithms that will be used uh, when they're finished with that. Then, um, of course, everybody will have them. But uh, those are the ones uh, that NIST selected. And if we get a curveball from NIST where we go a different direction or something else comes in, we have architected to be crypto agile um, for both changes in NIST as well as any sort of export regulations. Mm -hmm. So that's the insurance policy on that. Okay, uh, uh, Chris, Aaron, stay on for this. Uh, if vulnerable quantum ciphers on TLS sessions, uh, won't the browser stop accepting, accepting for, I'm, I'm reading as is 4M client connections, which should not have quantum ciphers enabled. What is the plan to act uh, or plan of action? Uh, there are specifically four uh, examples: um, a genuine everyday user who is trying to access a federal site and their browser doesn't support. So, Ooh. so that's the the. I mean, we do that now. Uh, we step back when we set up a session so that the server and the client are on the same page in terms of what uh, what algorithms they're going to use. So, our, if you're at TLS one point three and the, uh, the servers at 1.2, uh, your browser will step back to 1.2 so that you can secure that session. Similarly, if uh, the federal government has a quantum uh, resilient algorithm available to it, but the client that's accessing it doesn't, then they'll step back to the most common level of security that that session can support. Well stated, Aaron. Excellent. Let's keep going. A uh, question about um, what were the uh, Chinese uh, papers mentioned, the white papers? Can we share links or copies? Absolutely. Uh, send an email to Pete at qsecure.com or skip at qsecure.com. We'll share those with you. Um, there is a question here, another one. Might have missed the point. Key length is not relevant. Why? Uh, not sure I understand. Garland, I think you hit that one um, in your uh, presentation. Maybe you can hop in uh, that uh, on that. Sure. Um, so that really has to do with the eff efficacy of Shor's algorithm and how it run is well designed for quantum computers. And the algorithm, in fact, works more efficiently the larger the key size. So as you increase the key length, it really doesn't have an adverse effect on the eff efficacy of uh, Shor's algorithm. That's probably the uh, most concise answer that I can think of. Uh, guys, if you want to chime in. You nailed it as far as I'm concerned. That was, and you're getting to uh, cyber strategy. The guy that asked the question, guy or gal that asked this question, you're getting at a deeper question. Uh, and that's where we start talking about the, the, the key length is one, but depth uh, is what, and the noisy intermediate scale or quantum computing, it is really more like the um, binary optimization that's key length and depth that has a lot to do with what we're talking about for breaking that encryption. So when we talk about a hybrid compiler, a classic and quantum compiled computer, that's where the math is breaking down in the binary optimization. So for shores, we assume one, because that's where you have all the error corrected 4,099 quantum computer. When you're playing back and forth in the hybrid compiled word world, that's where you get a difference in the binary optimization. And in that case, key length and depth is, is very important. So hopefully the one and two geeky, there's plenty of stuff out there and a lot of good references we can pass you as well. And then you asked another question, I think Skip was gonna ask, uh, what incentive exists in industry to, to drive adoption for this? Fed is straightforward, what about industry? I think the, the way, and Garland, I'd love your opinion on this. One, uh, there's gonna be, we already, Aaron and Chris uh, already talked about NIST standards and, and what it's gonna to take to meet the bar to, you, you must be this strong, this encrypted to work with us on a federal space. There's a lot of secondary and tertiary companies that also have to meet that if they're gonna work with the federal government. They may not have their primary customer there, but as a secondary route, they're gonna to have to work with them. So 
when we do get that standard and you are on a path toward maturity for that encryption against a quantum computing threat, you're in a good spot. The earlier you do that with the less problem you have to go fix a backwards compatible, um, uh, I would say impedance mismatch, the better you're gonna be. Garland, over to you. Yeah, I think it also depends on the sector um, and the industrial control base, which you know a lot of that is privately owned. Um, however, it's um, uh, federally managed to, to a certain extent, and um, those requirements that apply to FCEBs and um, you know national security, they'll be levied on those industrial control components. I know um, Jennifer Easterly; that's been a large focus of hers. Is you know. Uh, interacting with those private sector companies that are in that space because of the uh, national security uh, uh, impact. Uh, so that that's one uh, reason. Also, I think we are going to see as much policy as we have seen. I think we will see um, some additional policy come out that uh, is very similar to some of the uh, supply chain requirements. So I think uh, in the context of those who uh, or work as cloud service providers, for example, and, you know, GovCloud. Um, if you're actually doing work for the federal government, there's going to be some uh, mandates levied there. Um, I've, I've talked to some government officials who alluded to this, they haven't really set up any uh, anything uh, concrete yet, but I expect it uh, very soon. And, and I will add one more, and I'd like Aaron to weigh it, because we, Chris, we've, we've, uh, we have done a webinar before, but we've got more updated information when we talk about the uh, energy sector where you, you do rely on ICS SCADA interaction, we've got protection on that. That will also probably come into a standards and you want to be ready for it, certainly before the power goes out. Uh, and our, our court capability that we briefed does lay in nicely over that to give some protection. Those are also gonna come out and you're gonna have to deal with those if you want water, power, lights, et cetera. So I just wanted to lay that in. We can get you that information because it, it is definitely in the middle of the federal play. Aaron, you came on because I'm, I'm sure I wanted to hear what you had to say about that. And Chris, if you have anything else on the ICS SCADA energy grid piece, late way in, brother. Actually, I just wanted to add uh, in the uh, Department of Commerce with the real estate business, uh, Fannie, Freddie, HUD, all of those companies that deal with uh, real estate brokers, title agencies and insurance agencies, as the government moves to this uh, post-quantum standard, then they will uh, essentially force all of those people involved in that particular part of the industry to adopt those standards because of the security that uh, is provided. So you'll see that, it, it, I mean, it's not really an incentive, but if they wanna to continue to do business in the real estate market, then they'll have to do it. Yeah, Darren, you nailed it. That's when I mentioned the secondary and tertiary markets, title uh, re-lenders, re uh, mortgage transfer, those all are gonna to have to come into standard under, and, and HUD and FEMA is one example, maybe naturally forced with a hurricane or something else, but they roll up under, Garland, you brought this up earlier, those roll up under DHS and roll up under commerce too. So it's gonna be a natural adoption. The other thing to think about if you are on the call still as one of the 39 diehards still here and you're part of a, uh, you're looking at commercial industrial base that's federally managed. Now you're thinking about defense industrial base that also has direct federal management. All, all your additional resellers, all your uh, commercial suppliers coming in that are providing those smaller pieces and parts for larger products that you make under program of record, those are all gonna come into those standards that Garland talk, talks about as well. All right, let's wrap everybody. I think we've gone over time, but it's been uh, hopefully very informative. Uh, again, uh, contact information is on the screen. If you have further questions, thoughts, would like to talk, please reach out. Thank you so much to the audience and attendees here. Uh, thank you so much to our great speakers. Um, and we've got another webinar coming up on 22 February. So thank you everybody, have a great day.